수정, 그 웹사이트에 해갖고 학생들 50분까지 좀 들어와 달라고 좀 하세요. 잠깐 그 오리엔테이션 좀 알려줄게. 이 캠퍼스에다 붙이면 될 거예요. 음, 박재영 교수님 들어오셨는데 저한테 5분만 좀 먼저 할애를 좀 해주세요. 안녕하세요. 네? 안녕하세요. 잘 지내셨어요? 아, 네. 네. 잘 지내고 있습니다. 네. 저 학생들이 이게 공식 수업이라 네, 네. 어, 원래 제가 미리 50분까지 들어와 달라고 했어야 되는데 10시로 그냥 했거든요. 그래서 10시 5분에 시작해 주시면 돼요. 제가 이 수업이 어떻게 되는지만 오리엔테이션 짧게 하고 연결하세요. 아, 네. 알겠습니다. 오늘이 새 학기 첫 수업인가요? 네, 첫 수업입니다. 네. 아, 네. 어, 새 학기 시작을 열어서. 거기 그린스 보러인가요? 네, 그린스 보러 있습니다. 나는 그린스 보러는 가보진 못했는데 시골이죠. 아, 그렇죠. 사실 노스캐롤라이나 자체가 사실 특별한 일 아니면 올일 없는 동네긴 하죠. 노스캐롤라이나는 그래도 동부라고 사람들이 그래도 시골 아닐 거라고 생각하지만. 네. 저도 사실 여기 학교 오기 전에는 노스캐롤라이나가 어디 있는지도 몰랐어요. 몰랐어요. 네, 음. 사실 가본 와본 적도 없고, 근데 와 보니까 역시 시골이긴 하더라고요. 음, 그러니까 미국은 가보면 진짜 커요. 안 가보면 그냥 미국. <웃음> 그렇죠. 네, 저희는 이제 이번 다음 주부터 이제 스프링 브레이크라서 네 이제 벌써 아. 저희는 네, 중 학기가 봄 학기 한 중간 정도 끝났습니다. 저희 어, 스프링 브레이크 어디 가십니까? 어 아니요, 뭐 특별한 계획은 없고요. 그냥 뭐. 음. 네, 그냥 휴식 시간인 것 같아요. 음. 열심히 연구하셔야죠. <웃음> 아, 오늘 뭐 초대해 주셔서 너무 감사드립니다. 아니, 뭐 우리가 더 감사하죠. 우리 새로운 걸좀 배워야 되는데, 어, 사실 우리가 할수 있는 연구, 제가 할수 있는 연구 중에 이제 구조방정식하고 마케팅 <웃음> 실험 연구하고 텍스트 마이닝하고 아, 사실 나머지가 지금 이크로메트릭스예요. 그러니까 세 가지는 저도 논문을 지도하고 쓸수 있는데 
이코노메트리스는 제가 셀줄 몰라요. 그래서 기다리다가 어, 교수님한테 조금 어, 인트로덕션이라도 좀 배우면 그걸 배운 토대로 해갖고 좀더 그쪽으로도 한번 해보려고. 아, 네. 사실 뭐 마음만 먹으시면 금방 뭐 하실 수 있을 것 같긴 하지만 아, 마음만 먹으면 <웃음> 학생들한테 시키면 되는데 <웃음> <웃음> 학생들도 뭘 알아야 하지 그냥 시키면 안 되고 알좀알수 있게끔 하고 이 수업이 그러면 어, 석사과정 수업인가요? 아니 박사과정, 아니, 수업. 박사과정 수업이고 아니, 석박사과정 수업이고요 아, 네네. 대체적으로 이제 어, 경희대학교 전체 학생들, 인문사회, 공대한테 공유가 됩니다. 그래서 여기에 지금 다양하게 어, 뭐 빅데이터 응용과도 들어와 있고 정치외교학과도 들어와 있고 당연히 경영학과도 들어와 있고 그렇습니다. 전자공학과도 들어와 있고 네. 아, 네네. 네, 이게 학점을 주기 때문에 네, 그리고 뭐 크게 노된 건 없고 또 세미나 듣는 거기 때문에 네, 유튜브에 그렇지만, 올라온 뭐 지난 뭐 세미나들 다 어느 정도 봤었는데 어, 굉장히 훌륭하신 분들이 이미 세미나를 많이 해주셔가지고 어, 또 부담은 또 부담도 좀 갖고 시작하게 됩니다. 아, 아 그래도 뭐 우리 박 교수님이 하고 있는 전문 분야를 따라올 사람은 없고 아 이게 이제 전체적으로는 제가 이제 MIS 전공이었기 때문에 MIS 쪽 교수님들하고. 다음에 이제 관광 쪽 교수님들하고 믹스 해갖고 예, 인바이트를 합니다. 그래서 이제 예, 우리가 바, 방법론은 똑같은 걸 쓰거든요, 사실. 그렇죠. 예. 사실 방법론적으로 뭐 학문 분야의 차이가 있진 않으니까요. 네, 예, 없죠. 그러니까 방법론적으로는 MIS가 훨씬 더또 솔리드하고 훨씬 더그 어, 뭐라고 할까? 예, 완벽한 쪽에 가깝게 예, 하죠. 그런데 우리는 그 방법론을 가져다가 이제 배워서 우리 분야에 어플라이를 하면 사실 우리 분야는 되게 넓고 인문, 사회, 예술, 문화, 엔터테인먼트가 다 포함되기 때문에 사이테이션은 우리가 훨씬 높아요. 네. 그러니까 사실 요즘 나오는 무슨 어, HCR 같은 거나 어, 구글 스탠포드 엘스비어 그탑 2%나 이런 데는 관광 교수들이 많이 상위권에 진입돼 있죠. 그렇지만 방법론은 MIS가 훨씬 뛰어나기 때문에 제가 일부러 자꾸 MIS 교수님들을 불러다가 방법론을 배워서 우리 쪽 도메인에다가 오프라인을 하려고 하는 거죠. 그러면 우리 쪽 탑티어에 갈수 있는 어떤 기회를 더 많이 잡을 수 있거든요. 네, 사실 뭐 말씀하신 대로 뭐 교수, 일단 교수님이 제 대표적인 예이신데 사실 MIS랑 소리즘 자체의 경계가 굉장히 좀 옅기 때문에 굉장히 좀 서로 뭐 시너지가 될수 있는 부분이 되게 많은 것 같아요. 비단 방법론 뿐만 아니고도 뭐 여러 가지가 사실 공유하고 네. 있는 부분이 많은 것 같아요. 그렇죠. 사실 이제 빅데이터가 아, 되면서 또 AI, 예, 인공지능이 등장하면서 사실 데이터 드리븐 리서치들이 각광을 받는 건 맞는데 그게 이제 뭐 뱅크가 될 수도 있고 또 커머스가 될 수도 있고 근데 우리 쪽은 이제 관광 쪽이니까 사실 사람들은 관광을 다 다니기 때문에 그쵸. 그러니까 실제적으로 자기가 하는 행동들에 대해서 데이터를 분석하기 <웃음> 좀더 와닿죠. 사실 뱅크나 커머스는 어, 사실 우리가 직접 아니 뭐 그건 돈벌이는 잘 되는데 직접 하 몸으로 느껴지는 건좀 덜하죠. <웃음> 그렇죠. 네, 그래서 박지훈 교수님도 기회가 되면 <웃음> 저희랑 한번 TM도 투어즘 매니지먼트라 매니지먼트가 들어가서 모르겠어요. 다른 데는 굉장히 높게 쳐주던데 경영학 쪽에서 네 그런 걸로 알고 있습니다. 네. 이미 지난 코펜하겐에서 교수님께 네. 스마트 투어즘에 대해서 이미 세뇌가 한 절반쯤은 됐기 때문에 <웃음> 어쨌든 그쪽으로 좀더 익스텐션을 해보려고 네, 생각합니다. 한번, 한번 기회를 같이 한번 하시죠. 아, 네, 너무 좋죠. 아, 훌륭한 학생들이 있기 때문에. <웃음> 자, 여기 학생 여러분, 이제 세미나가 곧 시작할 텐데, 수업 듣는 분들은 공이 꼭 자기 이름을, 본명을 써주시고요. 그 출석 체크가, 이 수업에서는 가장 중요한 게 출석 체크하고, 
어, 한 페이지에 요약본 내는 게 가장 중요해요. 학점 받는데. 예. 매우 기계적으로 하기 때문에 여러분들한테 부담을 적게 드리면서 전 세계에 있는 굉장히 훌륭한 연구자들을 접할 수 있는 기회를 드리고자 이 수업을 기획했고 또 어, 대체적으로는 어, 한국 분들이 오시면 어, 여기 한국말을 전혀 못 알아드시는 분이 계시면 영어로 하고 어, 대체적으로 한국 분들이 많고 영어가 뭐 한국말도 알아듣는데 전혀 지장 없으면 뭐더 쉽게는 한국말로 합니다. 아, 그래서 어, 요즘은 뭐 한국말이 또 세계적인 추세 아니겠어요? 네. 그래서 한국말로도 하고 아, 영어로도 하고 하는데 이, 이 과목이 그래도 영어이기 때문에 아, 대체적으로는 영어로 하고 여러분들이 만약 질문하거나 뭐할 때는 영어, 한국 분한테 한국말로 질문해도 우리가 알아듣고 또 이렇게 할수 있도록 플렉서블하게 할 겁니다. 자. 우리 학생분들 이게 이제 정규 수업입니다. 그래서 10시에 공식적으로 세미나를 시작하는데 5분 전에 제가 먼저 들어오시라고 했고요. 아, 저는 저 어, 스마트 관광원의 구철모 교수입니다. 아, 그래서 여러분들 이 수업은 사실 공식적인 거기 때문에 비디오를 켜주시기 바랍니다. 그 비디오를 켜야지 바, 말씀하시는 분도 여러분들 얼굴을 보면서 인터랙션을 하면서 어, 강의를 하고 세미나를 할수 있습니다. 그게 사실은 에티켓이고 줌 영상으로 어, 끄고 듣는 거는 피치 못할 사정으로 끄고 듣는 거예요. 어, 대체적으로 서로 공감돼 있거나 서로 어, 신뢰가 있거나 하면 어느 세미나를 하거나 어느 워크숍을 가도 다이 컴퓨터를 키고 합니다. 왜냐하면 상대방에 대한 존중 때문에. 근데 학생들은 그걸 잘 모르기 때문에 끄거든요. 끄고 뒤에서 그냥 소리를 들어요. 어, 그거는 사실 발표하는 사람에 대한 에티켓이 아니고 여러분들은 또 학생 수업이기 때문에 컴퓨터를 얼굴을 보여줘야지 어, 출석 체크를 할 거고 여기에 세미나로 들어오신 분들이 있어요. 그분들은 제가 강제하지 않겠습니다. 그분들은 뭐 끄고 들었더라도 뭐 어쩔 수 없죠. 자. Okay, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Chol Kucholmo, uh, Professor Ku uh, uh, in the Smart Tourism Education Platform. We made that name, but actually College of Hotel and Tourism Management to Gyeonggi University. Um, I launched the Smart Tourism Education Platform and I made this international seminar program for our students uh, for helping to understand the world renowned research capability and researchers. And many uh, here, the, the main participant, uh, uh, main participating students are uh, College of Business and Tourism Discipline and some other uh, students. But as I mentioned briefly between uh, uh, Professor Park ji and me, actually the methodology uh, the methodology which we apply for our tourism domain or business are all, almost the same or same. So uh, if, however, the methodology from the social science is much more strong and solid and rigid in business department. Uh, there's a reason because uh, the, College of Business actually, they have been uh, beginned 100 years ago, 100 years ago from psychology and sociology. So that's why the, the methodology uh, is so rigid and strong. Uh, however, tourism discipline is many, many uh, begins at the end of the 1960 and 1970 because of uh, uh, growth of economy and um, the usually uh, tourism management and tourism domains uh, they are focused on operation of hotel and tourism industry rather than academy itself but however uh, with the developing of the economy and with the developing of the industry with the diversity 
uh, the convergence between uh, tourism and business and other engineering department and, and tourism uh, absolutely we need uh, to develop our methodology for uh, understanding causality of uh, tourism behavior and experience. That's why I mainly invite uh, uh, several discipline professors from all over the world. So is this, this course is a very good, very good opportunity for you to expose world level research uh, status. Okay, as I sharing the list of uh, presenters uh, during this semester, we are invited all over the world. So please do not miss the chance. And from now on, I am introduce uh, Professor Park Ji Yong briefly, and he uh, let me focus. Uh, his name is Ji Yong, Ji Yong Park, okay, Park Ji Yong. Uh, he works for University of North Carolina, North Carolina at Greensboro. I don't know where it is. I never been there before. He is now assistant professor of information systems at University of North Carolina at Greensboro and PhD in management engineering from my neighboring, our neighboring school, KAIST. So he got PhD from KAIST. My dream actually, I want to, try, I want to make our program just like a KAIST. I tried to copy KAIST uh, level and I want to make you, you guys, uh, the KAIST level and then get a job in the world outside of Korea, like him, Dr. ji Professor Park. So uh, he, he has been uh, research on green IT IIS, social impact of digital platform value of IT investment. His work appeared in journals such as Management Science, which is a top journal in management area. MIS Quarterly, that's the, the top tier journal in MIS. Information System Research is also top tier journal in MIS and others. And he is an organization of a Korea Summer Workshop and causal inference since 2017. So the, actually the reason why I invited him for this seminar, he has been doing his research seminar since 2017 and very popular lecture and uh, almost all MIS uh, researchers are really, really highly interested in his lecture and very, very like his lecture. And he is, uh, is one of the number one this methodology in the world. So today is, is, uh, is the first time to expose his methodology to the tourism field. So I want to enjoy this lecture. And if you have a question, feel free to ask him. Okay. From now on, uh, Professor Park Ji Yong uh, is all your stage. Okay, let me finish. Okay. Okay, thank you for introducing me, uh, Dr. Chermogu. So thank you for having me today. I hope uh, you guys are having a great start to this new semester, spring semester. And I'm really honored to open up this research seminar this semester. And I really appreciate it, uh, especially for uh, Professor uh, Chermogu. Uh, as introduced, uh, my name is Jiyong Park, and I'm an assistant professor of information systems at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. So, today, so before we start, uh, first, uh, let me share my screen and then... Oh, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, it's coming now. Yes. And also, let me share this uh, slide with you. So uh, feel free to download the slide for your reference. And and I, I I'm gonna uh, talk. 
I'm going to uh, present uh, today's talk in English, but uh, feel free to ask uh, in either English or Korean, uh, whichever you feel, free, uh, you feel comfortable. So, and if you have any questions about something outside of the today's talk, and then I'm going to also answer to your questions in Korean as well. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, interrupt me anytime in the middle of the, my presentations, okay? And also, so when I present, uh, when I talk, um, I might not be able to monitor the uh, chat room. So uh, please turn on your microphone if you have questions, okay? All right, so in the following two weeks, I will be talking about the causal inference frameworks and methods. So before moving on, uh, let me uh, briefly introduce myself. So as uh, Dr. Oku already introduced, uh, I've spent six years in Hongrin, uh, right next to the Gyeonggi University uh, for my PhD at KAIST. And ever since I have worked in the US, and I work on in the MIS area. And in particular, my research interest is how information systems and technologies can contribute to the society uh, with a particular focus on environmental sustainability and social outcomes such as employment and job security. So however, so today I'm gonna focus on the research methodologies uh, that can be applied to any other field. Uh, so not to mention the tourism, but and so, uh, so the methodologies I'm gonna talk about today uh, is very universal uh, enough to be applied to any other, um, any other area. And Indeed, I, I have organized the summer workshops on causal inference for six years. Uh, it was initiated in 2017 uh, as an internal workshop at KAIST uh, when I was a third year doctor student. And now uh, since COVID, uh, it has moved to online and in recent years, it has received increasing attention across different uh, disciplines. So, uh, my goal of today's talk is to make you get into what causal inference is, why it is so important uh, in this era of big data and AI, and importantly, what we can do for our research, uh, no matter which field you are in. And because of those workshops, actually, I happen to have another another job uh, like a youtuber so you can find the the whole seminar videos there on this youtube channel uh, which is called in uh, so here so what i just uh, uh, what i want to say is that there are additional resources uh, you can dig into if you feel interested uh, about the causal inference after today's seminar so uh, feel free uh, to refer to the uh, videos uh, after this, today's talk. There are uh, about 100 videos on the YouTube, so, which means that the Koja inference uh, contains a wide range of content. So it is not easy to uh, deliver the, everything about the Koja inference uh, in a couple of hours. So. Um, this week and next week, I'd like to focus more on the basic concepts of causal inference, and I'd like to introduce several uh, powerful tools uh, you can apply for your research. So before moving on, uh, let me ask a very basic question. Uh, what is the cause and effect? Is there anyone who want to answer this? I take it easy. It is a very, very simple question. Okay. Cause and effect. After I listening your lecture and I become intelligent. <laughs> it's a cause and effect. 
I hope I can prove that. <laughs> yeah, right. Actually, it's, it's very easy concept, right? I think everyone here will know what it is. And even, you know, even kids understand like their teeth will decay if they eat too many sweets and chocolates, mm -hmm. right? All those reasoning is based on the cause and effect, right? And thinking about cause and effect is very common in our daily lives mm -hmm. and nothing uh, difficult in here. Mm -hmm. And so the cause and effect or causal relationship is no more than what you think it is. The cause and, cause and effect formally indicates a relationship in which one event makes another event happen. That's it. Uh, so there, there is no special meaning for causal, infer, uh, causal if, effect in causal inference. Then uh, what is the causal inference? It should be also straightforward, right? So causal inference means the process, the scientific process of identifying a causal, causal effect of a particular phenomenon of interest from data. So typically, so we are concerned about observational data because experimental data would not bother ourselves. I'm gonna uh, explain why, uh, why uh, the important thing is the observational data for causal inference. So, causal inference is the, the today's talks, uh, the, the main topic of today's talk and also the next week's talk. So uh, let's get started uh, to take a closer look at the causal inference. So first of all, uh, we need to understand the causal inference frameworks we can rely on uh, when we estimate the causal effects uh, more formally. So I think uh, many of you here are working on or interested in data science and analytics, right? So, so this is uh, the, my viewpoint about the data science in terms of the methodologies. The data science basically aims to obtain insight uh, from data uh, to inform better decisions in any uh, areas. Uh, so big data is here. So big data is actually just an ingredient of data science, right? Big data itself um, doesn't uh, talk about anything. Then what do we analyze this big data for? In terms of such purposes of data analysis, data science and analytics can be divided into two broad paradigms, prediction and causal inference. So here, I think uh, most of you are from already familiar with this prediction because uh, these predictions uh, mostly related to the machine learning. So prediction includes the model fitting approach like machine learning models, as well as an information filtering approach like uh, recommendation systems. On the other hand, causal inference includes uh, two broad approaches, a design-based approach and graph-based approach. So uh, this is uh, what I talk about during the two weeks, today and next week. So although uh, I will elaborate on those frameworks uh, later, uh, let me uh, briefly uh, introduce um, uh, what the design-based approach is and what the graph, uh, graphical causal model is. So simply put, the design-based approach relies on the potential outcome framework. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, shortly later. Uh, it, so this uh, design-based approach aims to remove any sources that uh, hinder the causal inference by design. So for example, the randomized control trials, the randomized experiment uh, is a case in point here. On the other hand, the graphical causal model takes a little different approach from the design-based approach. The graphical causal model uh, doesn't use the experiments. Instead, the graphical causal model uh, which is also called the structure causal models, uh, aims to explicitly account for the causal structure among variables, uh, as shown here. 
So although both frameworks are related to each other to a certain extent, they take a little different approaches to causal inference. And this is because they originated from different disciplines as exemplified by awards to pioneers in each area. So as many, um, many of you already know, the, the Nobel Economics Prize in 2021 went to pioneers of this design-based approach for causal inference, uh, including David Carr, uh, Joshua Engrist, and Huidoin Benz. On the other hand, the Judea Pearl, uh, who invented uh, such graphical causal models, uh, received the Turing Award, which is equivalent to the Nobel Prize in computer science field. So this explains why the potential framework has been more popular in social science areas, whereas the graphical causal model or structural causal models is rooted in computer science and artificial intelligence communities. So, in, so today, I'd like to introduce um, those two um, most powerful um, causal inference frameworks and then uh, what method we can use uh, based on uh, these two uh, frameworks for our research. Okay, Professor Park, um, yeah. before we go, uh, let me ask one uh, stupid question to you. The previous uh, there, slide. There, there's no previous stupid question. Slide. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, let, let, can, can you show me the previous slide? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, this one. Design-based approach. Okay, the table 1.1 actually illustrates uh, as very uh, simple and impactful, you know, the causal uh, effect. Uh, so there's a unit is aspirin, Y, no aspirin, and no aspirin is a, uh, uh, no, headache and no headache. So we got the uh, idea and the learning from this result tables improvement due to the aspirin. If, but however, right side is, is pretty much simple and impactable to understand uh, what is uh, cause and what is the result. So actually in, in tourism context, when we go into the TripAdvisor, there's a lot of the text mining and text, you know, the, the uh, tourism experience uh, from previous uh, travelers, blah, blah, blah. But we are much familiar with that the star rating as a five rating, 4.5 rating and that sort of things. So travelers actually uh, uh, use both together text and uh, graphic. But the graphic image is much impactful to the humans. It's a simple and, uh, and uh, parsimonious. So anyway, uh, in, in academia, uh, we use this post, post together for yeah. giving understanding to the reviewers and the, audio, uh, the, the uh, uh, readers. Uh, so uh, what do you think? At this moment, for human beings, which one is much more uh, impactful to the consumers and reviewers? But actually, in the when I writing a proposal, mm -hmm. I always uh, uh, address to my student, PhD students, uh, use together. One is table, another is a figure. So figure much more uh, feel like uh, something something there. And table is much more is academic and scientific scientific result. So it's it's it's, it's much more like a, 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 there is something there. So what do you think? It's, it's a stupid question. <laughs> and no, actually, that's a very fundamental and very important question because uh, recently there has been a lot of debate about uh, which approach is better. Uh, it potential outcome framework is based on the econometrics and graphical based approach takes a not different approach. So, uh, so there, there have been many uh, debates and arguments about the econometric versus structural causal models. Mm -hmm. uh, but at this point, both 
approaches have been developed in parallel mm -hmm. because they have the pros and cons actually. Mm -hmm. So for example, such design-based approach has been known uh, to have a um, strength in terms of the policy design mm -hmm. that involves some intervention, intervention design. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, so let me uh, write, annotate here. Mm -hmm. So the main, main purpose of this design-based approach is to design a right intervention and right manipulation of input. For example, in these examples, the main decisions would be whether we should take aspirin or not in order to reduce our headache. This is about the intervention strategies, right? Mm -hmm. So if the main goal is the, the specific intervention or manipulation, design-based approach uh, would work better. Uh, however, one of the limitations in this design-based approach is that it, is, uh, it doesn't care about the, the mechanisms underlying, okay. uh, underlying uh, these phenomena, the relationship between aspirin and, and uh, headache. Okay. Even though we have no ideas of how aspirin works to reduce the headache, we can estimate the causal effects by designing uh, an experiment. Yes, yes. On the other hand, so in that sense, such it, it, in, in, in the case is like uh, we take pill, the aspirin is to reduce the uh, force pressure, but we don't know exactly why the aspirin. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. It. It, it, it could be placebo or something. Ah, okay. Yeah, but on the other hand, this grap graphical mm -hmm. causal models has a strong advantages in, in terms, it explicitly uh, account for the mechanisms through which the one cause have an effect on the outcome. Yeah, but it has also some limitations. And actually, uh, let me uh, add, add one more thing. So actually, these two frameworks is more than just the graphics and tables because based on, so because they, they have different assumptions and different definition of cause and effect. And accordingly, they use the different methods to estimate cause and effect. So which I'm gonna elaborate more on uh, in the today's uh, talk. Okay, thank you. But, yeah, but still, uh, these two methods are not exclusive to each other because uh, these days, econometrics uh, has began, begun to adopt the graphical causal models. And mm -hmm. at the same time, mm -hmm. the computer scientists and AI researchers also uh, adopt some econometric approaches. So uh, they seem to converge uh, to each other to a certain extent. So uh, that's why I believe that it is important to understand uh, both approaches and, and understand uh, the pros and cons of different approaches. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So is there any other questions? Okay, so just like uh, Dr. Gu asked, so if you have any questions, uh, just feel free uh, to interrupt me and stop me anytime. All right, then, before moving on uh, to the potential outcome framework, let me emphasize two things because uh, I'm sure that many of you are interested in machine learning and big data, right? So in terms of the uh, causal inference, you should keep in mind two important things. First, uh, most machine learning models uh, you might have learned are basically geared towards predictions, not based on the correlations not cause and inference. So machine learning, the simple machine learning models uh, without the special considerations, it cannot be used for cause and inference. So like uh, the, any, the decision trees, random forest, the neural networks uh, and support vector machines and so forth. However, importantly, it doesn't mean that machine learning is useless for causal inference because causal, causal machine learning is one of the most active research area these days, such as causal forest, double machine learning, and causal reinforcement learning, and so forth. But uh, the, the traditional machine learning models 
uh, cannot be used for causal inference. And that's the, the first thing I'd like to uh, emphasize. And second, the big data is absolutely helpful for causal inference. And there's no doubt about that. But the big data itself cannot solve the causal inference problems. So, uh, so uh, you need to keep in mind that it is causal inference framework and not the size of data that determines whether you can properly estimate the causal effect uh, in your context. So that's why I'd like to introduce the causal inference frameworks to you uh, today. And, and, and so um, before uh, I introduce the, um, the potential outcome frameworks, I think uh, it would be important to understand why causal inference uh, is so important. So uh, to this end, uh, it would be helpful to see a brief history of causal inference uh, towards the uh, credibility revolutions, uh, which is one of the most important trends in empirical research in the past decades, uh, especially in social science uh, disciplines. So as I mentioned, the recent Nobel Prizes recognized empirical contributions to causal inference uh, in 2019 and 2021. As you know, historically, Nobel Prizes recognize the theoretical contributions uh, rather than empirical or methodological contributions, right? So I, so I think those, um, the recent uh, Nobel Prize explains uh, how important the causal inference is, especially in this era of uh, data science and analytics. And, and actually, here, the, the, the Nobel Prize winners are not inventors of those causal inference methodologies, such as randomized control trials, natural experiments, and instrument variables. Those methods actually have been used since at least several decades ago, perhaps 1950s. So then, what are their main contributions? So, uh, so in order to understand uh, these contributions, you need to understand the underlying trend in empirical research, uh, which is called the credibility revolutions. So the Nobel Prize in economics last year uh, has been described as a celebration of empirical revolutions or a victory in the credibility revolution. So uh, since then, the, the, the term, the credibility revolution has received um, a great deal of attention. So let me briefly, uh, explains uh, the, this uh, history of credibility revolutions uh, to motivate you about uh, the causal inference. So in 1983, uh, Edward Lehmer from UCRA uh, raised a concern about the sensitivity and reliability of empirical and statistical analysis in econometrics. So in this paper uh, published in American Economy Review, uh, the Edward Lehmer uh, argues that econometric analysis involves um, so many options uh, fitting, uh, fitting uh, many, uh, many of the statistical models, uh, perhaps the thousands of statistical models, but uh, one or only several uh, that the researcher finds pleasing are selected for the proposing, uh, so the reporting proposed in papers. So the, the, because of such information asymmetry uh, between the, um, the researchers and readers, the result from data analysis published in papers uh, could be very sensitive and less reliable uh, given uh, such high sensitivity. So when this paper was published, uh, there was an intensive debate on the validity of the data analysis. So uh, many people uh, doubt about uh, what the, the valid validity of the data analysis to reveal the causal relationship because uh, we could get very different results uh, with different models and different uh, results and different samples. Professor Spa, yep. I have another question. Uh, okay. Like uh, this, this slide is tell us the, the importance of the the statistics and um, the the fundamental the analytics skills of the uh, data something like that. But these days, you know, everybody uh, already know the chat GPT is uh, so become you know important and popular in the world suddenly, all of a sudden. So, but we 
uh, as a user, we don't know exactly what's going on over there. That's just a, a, a phenomenon of uh, artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence actually de was developed by based on this kind of theory and this kind of uh, the analytics skills. Uh, isn't it? No? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, that's not easy to answer because at this moment, I cannot see uh, the clear relationship between econometrics and, and the artificial intelligence. But okay. I would say that actually, basically, as you, as you correctly pointed out, the chat GPT or uh, many AI applications mm -hmm. um, do not consider the causal relationship in their uh, decisions. Okay. So they they tried to uh, they tried to uh, look at some relationships among the data, uh, mm -hmm. but many in, in also in computer science uh, areas uh, there is uh, there is also the critics about the correlation based AI mm -hmm. uh, because in many cases and in many reasonings uh, we need the causal understandings. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, recently uh, there has been some um, uh, trends in causal machine learning and mm -hmm. causal represented, uh, uh, representation learnings or something. So mm -hmm. these days, uh, uh, the um, recent researchers uh, try to uh, try to integrate the causal relation, uh, causal inference method into mm -hmm. the AI and machine learning uh, method. So I believe that causal inference uh, will play a very important role in future AI applications. Okay. But still, I totally agree with you that the recent AI applications do not consider the causal relationship. So that's why the current AI applications have uh, uh, rim limitations uh, to be applied in important decision makings at this point. Okay, okay. thank you. All right, then uh, let me uh, let me continue uh, here from here. Okay, so th so the credibility revolution. So since these uh, critics, um, after like after about thirty years in twenty ten, the Joshua Ingris from MIT, uh, who is also a Nobel Prize winner in twenty twenty one, wrote uh, another famous paper arguing that these lemur's compl uh, complaints no longer seems justified recently. In the past few decades, there have been a lot of important methodological advances, uh, which allows us to establish a more rigorous and more reliable, more credible causal relationship from data analysis. So from the, because of this paper, uh, people call this trend, this mega trend in empirical research, credibility revolutions. So let me show you some trends and some graphs that demonstrate the credibility revolutions, uh, especially in economics field. Um, first of all, the use of, the use of the randomized control trials or randomized experiments uh, has remained, had remained very low, even in economics until 2005. But you can see that it, it has been rapidly increasing since uh, 2005. Uh, however, there are much more cases that such experiments are not feasible, right? So uh, many people say that uh, what is more important uh, for credibility revolution was not the randomized experiments, uh, but the uh, other methods that can emulate uh, such randomized experiments using observational data. Uh, because in most cases, especially in social science, and not to mention the tourism, so the such uh, randomized experiments uh, are not always feasible. So even in such case, uh, when um, the randomized experiment is not feasible, uh, we should be able to estimate the causal effect even using the observational data. So such methods are called quasi experiments or natural experiments. So such quasi experiments um, 
do not involve the actual experiment, but uh, it aims to emulate the, the experiment by design. So, so here, so all methods described here so plays an, a central role in empirical research for causal inference, as including difference in differences, instrument variables, oh, sorry, uh, fixed effects, uh, regression discontinuity, matching, and synthetic control. So, and as you can see here, so those methods were not that popular before 2000s, but uh, so uh, you can see that those methodological advances are very recent changes. And because of those uh, causal experimental methods, um, the, the, um, now we can get a more credible uh, result about the causal relationship, even when we cannot conduct a randomized experiment. And this credibility revolution is not limited to economics, but is still on the way across all areas, especially the social science uh, disciplines. So for example, this is the, the case of the, the finance area in business. So those graphs also show that the use of the popular causal interest methods um, has soared, especially since the 2010. So even in the top, John, top finance journals, like journal of finance or in review of financial uh, studies, the causal inference method like instrument variables and difference and differences uh, were rarely used in even uh, top uh, finance journals. But since 2000s, you can see that uh, the, those methods have been uh, repeatedly uh, used. So I'm pretty sure that uh, such trends became even stronger after 2010. And I'm also sure that uh, such trend is ongoing in any other field these days. All right then. So now uh, we understand the, the current trend towards causal inference uh, that uh, aims to estimate the causal, if, uh, causal effect using data, especially the observational data uh, without actual experiments. However, why it is so important? Actually, uh, mm, you might think that the estimating a relationship between two variables is not that difficult. For example, so let's say we regress, uh, so let's say we regress y on x like this. And is it so easy to estimate the causal relationship between x and y using this VETA in the, the regression coefficients? So long story short, this regression coefficient uh, cannot represent the causal effect without any assumptions. I, I'm going to explain uh, why it is the case. And so before going into the causal inference methods, so I think it is very important to understand why causal inference is so challenging, um, even though it seems very easy in real life, in daily life. Because we don't have much difficulty in thinking about the causal relationships in uh, daily life, right? And we can easily estimate the relationship between the two different variables uh, using regressions like this. But why it is so difficult uh, to estimate the causal effect? And so why uh, causal inference is so challenging? So let me uh, take some examples, some examples uh, to convince you of the important, the challenges in causal inference. And so that uh, you can understand um, why the causal inference frameworks are actually necessary to estimate the causal effect. So I think uh, many students here have already heard of this popular quote, correlation does not causation. So uh, it, it's very simple, right? And it's, so I think, so here the correlations indicates that just a co-movement in the same directions or the opposite directions. Uh, and the causation indicate the cause and effect. So uh, there is um, nothing special meaning here. So 
this means uh, exactly uh, the same as uh, what you understand these sentences. So, so let's see some examples of correlations and causations. So according to this uh, trend, so does more iPhone use cause more people die from falling down the stairs? Or does watching sports games reduce your weight? So uh, is the watching sports games uh, helpful for your diet? Or do people who visit Orlando Universal Studios uh, purchase new cars? So actually, according to those, these graphs, the data itself seems to support those arguments, right? But um, I think um, no one here would agree with this. So from these examples, you might think that it is not difficult to distinguish between correlation and causation because it sounds very trivial. It sounds very straightforward, right? Uh, we can easily, uh, we can easily uh, think that this is not causation, but correlation. Okay. But the reality is that uh, so the thing is that the reality is much more complex than such simple examples, especially in your research context. So, uh, so I'd like to so so uh, I'd like to suggest that let's uh, forget such toy examples because the reality in your research uh, would be much more complex than mm -hmm. those simple examples. So, and it would be much more complex and much more nuanced uh, to distinguish between correlation and causation in, in reality. For example, and let's think about the recommendation system uh, you should be already familiar with. So, Sure. So uh, you might be already aware of the rec um, the popular recommendation algorithms such as uh, collaborative filtering, right? So collaborative filtering itself is very simple, and the basic idea of collaborative filtering is very uh, simple. It aims to identify the similar uh, the the similar items or similar uh, users uh, that have the similar preference. Mm -hmm. uh, but the in uh, in reality, the important decision making is actually the causal decision making, because after developing these recommendation systems, the main interest of the firms would be whether this recommendation system causes the increase in product sales and whether they should implement it in their service. So uh, this uh, decision is requires the causal inference about the causal effect of the recommendation systems on the sales. Okay, so uh, let's think about this causal relationship between recommendation systems and actual sales. So here, in these simple examples, uh, let's say user A and user B, uh, both pizza and salad. So uh, the simple collaborative filtering algorithms uh, would recommend the Coke uh, that user B already bought to user A because uh, according to, so as you can see here, they have similar preference, right? This is the basic uh, algorithm of collaborative filtering, right? And then uh, let's say the user A per actually purchased the Coke after this recommendation. In this case, do you think that the rec this recommendation has a causal effect on this purchase of Coke? So, what do you think? I, I, I think there's a it can be a cause, isn't it? No. I, I, I. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. It depends. It depends. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it depends on some assumption and assumption. Okay. Yeah, uh, actually, mm, so. I understand that uh, many of you, including myself, uh, easily thought that uh, it is about the causal relationship because the purchase occurred after this recommendation. Right? However, if we think about this phenomenon deeply, more deeply, uh, you will find that it is not easy to answer. Uh -huh. Because uh, let's think about this. Why did they 
user A and B buy pizza and seller. Is this because they are men in their 20s or is this because both of them uh, like riding a bike or something? And then why? Why both users purchase the Coke? It might be because having pizza and Coke together is a very popular option, uh, uh -huh. like chicken, a combination of chicken and beer or the samgyeopsal and soju. Uh -huh. So if this is the case, user A would purchase the Coke even without the recommendation, right? Because uh, user A and user B have the similar um, characteristics uh -huh. and both of them also like the, the, the combination of pizza and Coke. So uh, even uh, even in the absence of the, this recommendation of Coke, uh, I think um, many many of you are also uh, um, purchase a Coke uh, when you have the pizza. Mm. In this case, can we say this is caused by this recommendation system? It is not easy to say that. Mm -hmm. And in social science, such phenomena have been explained by homophily or the, the tendency for people to seek out or, or to be attracted to those who are similar to themselves. Mm. So, so simply put, think of your friends. You and your friends may share some interests and you may have similar preference. Mm. So your friend may like what you like. Mm. So you and your friend may purchase the similar items or the same items just because of this just because you and your friend have similar preference. Mm -hmm. And this purchase is not caused by your friend's recommendations, mm -hmm. right? It, you just bought uh, some items because of your purchase and mm -hmm. your friend uh, just happened to purchase the same item mm -hmm. because of his own, her own uh, preference, uh, which mm -hmm. is similar to yours. And this is not a causal effect, but just correlation between you and your friend. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the same for recommendation system. Mm -hmm. You would have your own style and your own preference. So uh, you may purchase the similar items uh, that just happen to be recommended uh, because of the, the similar styles of the items. Mm -hmm. This is not because of the recommendation systems, mm -hmm. right? So uh, such a phenomena is called homophily. So homophily uh, can be defined uh, person to person or item to items as shown mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. At the same time, mm -hmm. the peer effect or social influence um, can also work at the same time, mm -hmm. right? For example, you may purchase an item because of your friend's recommendations or uh, you can purchase. Uh, so the user A uh, might purchase Coke because of that recommendations. Mm -hmm. And then if this is the case, this is the clear causal effect because you would not purchase that item without this recommendation. Mm -hmm. So conceptually, it is not that difficult to distinguish between the homophily and peer effect or mm -hmm. correlation and causation. Okay. However, how can we distinguish between them using product sales data? Mm. Unfortunately, uh, it would be um, difficult. So okay. here in reality, we are, we are able to observe only mm. product sales data by users. Okay. So we know which user purchase which items, okay. but we don't know why they purchase items, okay. right? Okay. So <laughs> we don't know whether the purchase by friends was just because of the similar preference or homophilies okay. or okay. Such purchase was caused by actual recommendation mm -hmm. by their friends. Okay. The data doesn't tell us about the reasons and the okay. mechanism. So that's okay. why uh, mm -hmm. it is not easy to distinguish between causation and correlation only using data. Okay. Dr. Bao, yep. let, let, me, let me replace this uh, slide to our tourism context. Mm -hmm. Look. Here I am, and here you are. We are we are similar uh, professors, uh, men. The the different thing is a uh, age gap probably, and other stuff as well. But the 
based on two one uh, one is the uh, same gender another is the uh, same job and go to the room go to the room of uh, london mm -hmm. uh that is a uh, can say similar preference is it possible or a lot of the girls they are posting their pictures on their preference site into their instagram and another their friends also similar behavior happened so there is a similar preference we can say social homophily yeah yeah i think this context can be applied exactly the same to the tourism context as you described mm -hmm. so people have their own preference for tourism and mm -hmm. some tourist destinations so they might uh, bump into each other mm -hmm. uh, because so, they decided to decide some uh, mm -hmm. destination based mm -hmm. on their preference uh, which mm -hmm. are similar to each other this is just correlation. You and yeah. I just a uh, uh, similar preference for certain specific destination or city yeah, right. or restaurant, sort of sort of things. Pure effect is a social influence is like you, I am here, you are here. I clicked, and we influence you may click this uh London. Yep. That can be a social influence. I influence you to choose that one. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, if this is the case, uh, we can consider that as a causal effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. But however, you, we go to the item to item. We we are focusing on so far travelers and humans, but you you say the item to item. Mm -hmm. um, Here's the item. Uh, these days, I am go, uh, climb the mountains. I purchase a lot of the mountain gears and sort of things, and swimming gears as well. Is it related? Non related. It's totally the opposite side. But I, I choose two different you know sides. It's non related actually, but similar attractiveness to one person. What yeah, do you right. think? Yeah, uh, yeah, they could be related or unrelated depending on the context. Yeah, so here, I think here the item can be equivalent to the tourist destination or the, some activities like hiking or mm -hmm. something. So depending on the algorithms of the recommendations, so they could recommend the similar mm -hmm. A similar activities or a similar mm. uh, destination mm. or depending on the way the algorithm is designed so they mm. can recommend mm -hmm. uh, a little different uh, new activities or new destinations but mm -hmm. having said that uh, such uh, homophily uh, the, this logic of homophily uh, can be applied to either mm. case okay let, let me answer the why i I, I gave a question to you. My personal reason is going mountain and going swimming. Swimming is just uh, everyday life in the early in the morning and I can swimming myself and with a uh, uh, small amount of money and regular pattern. And then I can stay healthy for especially upper body side. And the climb mountain is is go mountain and the cheaper, and I can stay uh, the downside of my body like a leg. Mm -hmm. So the as a as a fifty, the old guy consider the health uh, condition a lot, and then think it's a simple but steady and cheaper, and and stay healthy like swimming and the mountain. So they we we actually is non-related to each item each other, but I my causal relationship is uh, caused by cost, price, and easy to do for uh, health, you know, exercise. 
What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think uh, the, the relation, so the, what you described uh -huh. is not directly related to homophily, but I think uh, that can be explained by some confounding factors, uh, confounding factors. Uh, confounding factors. Uh, yeah, like a cost or some, uh, the desires to uh, for fitness like this. Okay. Yeah, so if there are some confounding factors, then some correlations, uh, correlations and uh, can be found even okay. in the absence of the causations between the swimming and hiking. Okay. So I think the relation between them uh, can be explained by other, a third other uh, factors. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if uh, you consider some uh, recommendation systems uh, for the activities or for the tourist destination, then uh, the homophily uh, can work in that context. So, okay. So, is there any other questions? You can ask uh, uh, to him in English or in Korean, doesn't matter. Okay, then, so, so let me uh, continue uh, with these examples. So, and this is what actually happens in reality. Uh, according to a study that analyzed the Amazon data. So here, although, so here, so you can see that the recommendation click throughs uh, like this. So, so the such recommendation click throughs account for a large fractions of traffic on Amazon. However, according to this study, at least 75% of such activity uh, would like occur in the absence of the recommendations. So, so in, other, in other words, so if uh, come the Amazon uh, analyze the data, the sales data, and then uh, they might conclude that the recommendation systems are really work well. But about the 75% uh, would, would occur even without the recommendation systems. In other words, the user A are likely to purchase the Coke even in the absence of the recommendations, which is not the causal effect. So that's why, uh, so, so actually many people, uh, when they think the recommendation systems are using the collaborative filtering or any other machine learning algorithms, they tend to think that better algorithms always leads to the better decision perform uh, the business performance, which is not true in many cases in reality. So for example, this is a very, a, a very famous uh, case of Netflix recommendation systems. So, According, so here, there are two alternative uh, recommendation algorithms. So here um, among them, the second recommendation algorithms uh, work better in terms of recommendation relevance, uh, which is uh, one of the most popular uh, metrics to evaluate the recommendations performance. However, it turned out that users uh, actually liked the first algorithm more than the second one. So that's why every algorithm in Netflix uh, is tested for the causal, inf causal effect using A-B test before rolling out. And this is what happens in most companies. In most companies, especially IT companies uh, have their own platform for A-B test. So as you can see here, the algorithm development, uh, recommendation system, machine learning, or AI applications, uh, such algorithm development is not enough uh, in the real world the decision makings. So uh, those um, algorithm development uh, should be uh, accompanied with the causal inference and they should be tested in a causal manner or like this uh, in order to um, determine whether uh, we should implement and we should apply uh, such algorithm in, in service in reality. And let's, so uh, the, this, 
examples uh, illustrate uh, how challenging uh, it is to distinguish between correlations and causations uh, using data. And this time, let's think, think of another simple examples. So uh, let's think about the relationship between the pets, companion animals, and depression. So do you agree that adopting pet companion animals causes the increase or decrease in depression? So what do we think about the relationship between pets and depression? Uh, I don't know, but the, uh, it's not a depression, it's, it's for a uh, social trend, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. There, there, there should be so many factors uh, okay. that lead to depression. Uh. Uh. Yeah, so I think uh, there are many different opinions about that. Mm -hmm. So in, to answer that question, the best way would be uh, take a look at the data. Uh, what data says about the relationship between the pet and the depressions. So uh, let's consider these toy examples. Uh, this is not the real uh, data, but uh, this is just an example uh, to illustrate uh, the difference between correlation and causations. So according to this example data, the dep depression rate is found to be higher for those who actually adopted pets uh, compared to the, those who did not, mm -hmm. right? So, and then from this data, uh, we might conclude that the, the adopting pet uh, is positively correlated with the depression rate, mm -hmm. right? It, mm -hmm. But is it an actual causal effect? So if we adopt the companion animals, dogs or cats, mm -hmm. uh, will our depression rate increase? Mm -hmm. If the pets, uh, have some problem like a disease problem or some cancer, whatever, rheumatism, and it costs a lot of money and it causes uh, depression. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, that makes that, that makes sense, right? There, there could be uh, several stress mm -hmm. factors uh, mm -hmm. when we adopt uh, mm -hmm. companion union, mm -hmm. uh, companions, mm -hmm. animals, and also, you know. Uh, it has been well known uh, about some depressions after loss of their companion mm -hmm. uh, animals, their pets. So, uh, but there, uh, there can be alternative ex explanation about this. For example, so someone might argue that those who have a higher tendency of depressions uh -huh. uh, may be more likely to adopt pets. Uh, uh -huh. For example, the elderly people or, uh -huh. um, or the single families or something. Uh -huh. Yeah, so they might uh, tend to adopt more pets. Uh, uh -huh. uh, so if this is the case, uh, we can, uh, if we assume this, uh, we can obtain the opposite con uh, conclusions. Uh -huh. So here, if we compare within group depression rate by uh, depression, uh, tendency here, uh, let's say the depression tendency is X. So if we compare the, this uh, depression rate uh, within the group with the same X uh, like this, and then, so you can, as you can see here, adopting pets is negatively associated with depression rate, mm -hmm. right? So, and mm -hmm. interestingly, those two tables represent exactly the same data, mm -hmm. but, Depending on what assumptions we consider, the conclusions we, we can get uh, are re re uh, reversed, right? Totally the opposite, right? So, mm -hmm. so this is a typical example of Simpson's paradox. So Simpson's paradox means that the relationship in the total populations is different when the population is divided into subgroups. So or when we take a look at the populations, so uh, we can see the positive relationship between the 
the pets and differential rate. But uh, this, uh, once this population is divided into the two groups, the, the high depression group and low depression group, then uh, we, we got uh, the opposite conclusions about the relationship between pets and depression rate. The question is, which assumptions we should consider when we estimate the causal effect of the companion, union, uh, companion animals? It, it is not easy, all right? So that's why we need a more formal framework for causal inference to make our data analysis more rigorous and more convincing. Mm -hmm. And this such framework uh, helps us communicate our assumption with other, uh, other people, other researchers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bob, how yeah. about that? Oh, we we use depression rate as a dependent variable, mm -hmm. but we let's change the situation. What about the happy happy rate? Okay, people are try to adopt a path for their happy life. So, uh, I think a happy also increase depends on that the situation. Uh, but depression rate is a, a high and happy rate also high. I, that's my assumption, isn't it? Yeah, I think yeah, uh, that, uh, yeah, that is also possible. Uh, yeah, so I think that is also another uh, potential explanations to explain this. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 what I want to say is that the assumptions different researchers have mm -hmm. can be different. In this case, there is so that is your assumption, and this is my assumption. But there is no way to prove which assumption is better in this using data. That's mm -hmm. the main problem. Mm -hmm. Different people have different assumptions, but there is no way which assumption is right mm -hmm. in data because data itself doesn't mm -hmm. care about what assumption is right. Mm -hmm. But psychologically, you know, people in, uh, tend to adopt path is for their uh, individual life, especially uh, alone and lonely and friendship yeah. sort of things. There is much more to the positive side of the path, you know, uh, keeping. So if we highlight the selling point positive side, like increasing the, uh, uh, your happy moment, rather than depression rate. If you highlight like a, a cause of a lot of trouble and money and then sadness if you lost, if you lose um, sort of things. Uh, so uh, like a, if we look at the positive side uh, that people uh, maybe lose, uh, reduce much, reduce rate. If you think more highlight like, uh, some negative side sort of things, so, or uh, then people are maybe reduced the, the happy moment. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think. So thank you for bringing uh, bringing up that issues because you described the way uh, the causal inference has been established uh, before. Mm -hmm. Because in this case, what we can do is to use the theory, some theories, uh, mm -hmm. to make some assumptions. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for example, uh, we can uh, borrow some theories from psychologists and, or uh, some behavior science to to make some assumption about these relationships. Mm -hmm. So this is the the so such uh, the theory based causal inference has been dominant um, mm -hmm. in many areas. Mm -hmm. So, but sometimes we don't have any theories to make assumptions. Let me show you one arbitrary example. This is another example of Simpson paradox. So here, uh, let's consider two treatments, treatment A and B, and here the number is uh, mortality rate. And the mortality rate in here, in mortality rate in total patients was lower when they received the treatment A, mm -hmm. right? Then when they received the treatment B. However, once this population is divided into two groups, the patient with mild symptom and the patient with severe symptom, then the result uh, becomes opposite, right? So the, here, 
the in this case, which treatment do we do you think is better to reduce the mortality rate? In this case, we don't have any assumptions. Uh, so, in the previous in this previous case, uh, we can use our common senses or some theories to make assumptions about the how people perceive uh, when it comes to the depressions or the pet or something. Mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, we cannot use our common sense or theory uh, to make any assumptions here, right? If we focus, if we focus on the subgroups, then uh, we should treat B because the treatment B uh, has the lower mortality rate, uh, which is the better outcome, right? However, if we focus on the total population, uh, we should uh, we should uh, choose the treatment A, uh, mm -hmm. which has the lower uh, mortality rate. Mm -hmm. So it is. So here we cannot answer these questions uh, without the formal causal knowledge about uh, this phenomenon. So, for example. So we can consider the two causal structures in this case. So here, so let's say uh, this treatment as T and let's say this symptom as S and let's say this mortality rate is outcome as uh, Y. Then uh, we can consider two alternative structures uh, that leads to such a data. First, so T is our treatment and the Y mortality rate is our outcome then so the symptom uh, might be determined by so so let's so let's consider this sometimes doctors uh, determine which treatment uh, should receive depending on the patient's symptom in this case the treatment is determined by the symptom right and then for sure the symptom uh, might be related to the outcome the mortality rate Right. So this is the first uh, causal structure we can consider. And alternatively, we can also consider another causal structure. Like, so depending on the treatment, people, patients may have different symptoms, right? If the treatment itself has some e effect to relieve some symptoms like this. So, the thing is that depending on these causal structures, uh, we, sh we will have the different conclusions about the treatment. So as I described, oh, sorry. Okay, so if uh, the treatment was determined depending on the symptoms, then so, um, at this point, uh, it is not easy to explain the how in details the how to calculate these uh, numbers. Uh, but uh, here, so what I want to say is that uh, the actual causal effects uh, depends on uh, what causal structures uh, we assume. So in these causal structures, uh, we should uh, the treatment B is more preferred because uh, treatment B has the lower um, mortality rate, um, considering this causal structure. On the other hand, uh, let me see. Okay, so on the other hand, uh, if the treatment determines the level of symptom, then treatment A it should be uh, more preferred. So, in other, so what I want to say is here is that decision making from the same data uh, depends on the causal structure and the way the data was generated. So without such causal, the causal knowledge, uh, we cannot make any uh, decision makings in this uh, case. So uh, that's why it is important. Uh, so that's why it is important to, to understand the causal framework that help us uh, determine uh, which causal structure is better in a specific context and how to estimate the causal effects um, yeah, in a specific context. Okay. So that's uh, what I'd like to explain uh, more uh, later. Oh. And Very interesting. 
I have another example, but because of time limit, let me uh, skip this example. So, um, so actually, let me emphasize again the, the importance of causal inference in this era of big data, right? There is no doubt that big data opened up the huge opportunities, a huge research opportunities for us, right? So using big data, we can reveal some interesting relationship that would have been impossible before without big data, right? However, think about this. At the same time, big data also increases the possibility to find the wrong relationship, the superior relationship among data, because we have too many data. So uh, we could find some spurious relationships, spurious correlations among the data. So with more data being available, it becomes more and more difficult to is isolate a causal relationship from the uh, superior correlations among data. So that's why the causal inference frameworks and methods uh, have become more and more important uh, today uh, because of this, uh, the, the overflow of big data. So uh, let me conclude uh, this chapter. So again, what is causal inference? More formally, the causal inference um, includes the statistical and computational method for studying such questions and determining what causes what using data, especially using observational data uh, when we cannot conduct the experiments. Here's a, my question yep. before we go forward. Mm -hmm. um, in the big data, actually um, is a huge number of data, volume of data. We try to find out cause from the data. And, um, and um, your observation, observe the data and um, uh, uh, try to try to analyze uh, between uh, barriers, bar variables to variables. Uh, however, uh, in marketing guys, they are manipulated by themselves and then try to use the manipulation uh, without the big data and they can find out the causes simply with the small data. Oh, yeah. But sometimes that small data is exactly uh, uh, spot the causality rather than the big data. But however, big data is a reality, and the small data or the survey data is 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 manipulated by the researchers. That's the big difference. So, as as a researcher. Uh, what I think, what, yeah, uh, still the, the survey based the marketing experiment is powerful because they find out causality uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. But like when you explained so far, observational data, sometimes we don't know exactly the what is causes, what is the result. Result can be causes, cause can be uh, result. What, what, what do you think of my argument? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you that the big data has a huge values, uh, mm -hmm. especially uh, we can get more a realistic sense of what happens, uh, what is happening in reality from big data. Uh, so I have no doubt that big data uh, is very helpful uh, in causal inference, but I don't think the big data itself uh, is capable of identifying the causal relationships. The, the, the ability of big data to estimate the causal effect depends on, uh, depends on the how, uh, what, vari uh, um, what variables uh, can be controlled for. So a big data uh, means that uh, we could have a wider range of variables uh, so that we can control uh, more and more factors to, uh, to identify the causal effect or something. But yeah, so in that sense, the big data uh, absolutely helps uh, to estimate the causal effect. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
so so in at the end of this slide maybe uh, uh, maybe I will uh, talk more about next week uh, I uh, I'm gonna uh, introduce the, the some how to uh, how to select the control variables mm -hmm. uh, from big data uh, based on the causal inference framework okay. so 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 big data still powerful but uh, my argument is that if the big data uh, if big data is based on the causal uh, supported by the causal inference framework and then uh, it will become even more powerful okay. in re in revealing some relationship between variables okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, without such a framework, it is not easy to argue uh, mm -hmm. for the causal relationship between even for even uh, with big data, uh, we cannot observe everything that affects some phenomena, right? Even if we have uh, several hundred variables or thousands of variables, we cannot be sure that those variables can perfectly 100% explain some phenomena, mm. right? In that case, the, some formal framework can help to reduce uh, the possibility of the spirit correlation and confounder. So uh, that would be very helpful. Okay. Mm. Yeah, uh, thank you for asking that questions. So before we move on, to the potential outcome framework. Do you have any questions reg uh, regarding the causal inference? Okay, feel free to ask uh, the either language, your yeah, yeah, so language or the English. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can ask in Korean. The question is, the content filter filtering or the filter filtering is still available. Recommendation system is like a Babu got the chairman and then get to some Kyoga chairman. Yeah, yeah. The Sasharan could some Kyoga chatten and in got thrown up on a cricket pallion of the sea. Could go on a Sasha e train model offline as a train model of pallion than to one. It got a was in the real good collaborative filtering in the autumn best can it's autumn Pango Broden. That e tange so autumn item which some healthy at the end of your bonus such a cause in France like a cricket cano de. 안을 수 있는 부분이고 제가 말씀드리는 부분은 실제로 그 어떤 알고리즘에 의해서 도출된 그 추천 결과를 사람들한테 직접 추천을 했을 때그 사람들이 그거에 반응을 해서 어떤 액션으로 이어지는지가 코자 인프런스에 관련된 부분이지 아, 네. 이 모델 트레이닝 자체에 물론 뭐 경우에 따라서는 코자 인프런스 아이디어를 가지고 와서 뭐좀더 어드밴스드한 알고리즘을 만들 수는 있겠죠 근데 Basically, the collaborative filtering chatte algorithm and cause and influence of the cooking, one of them, but no, of double position that cost. I'm only to own recommendation of Hedro, though, such a good recommendation, Padassi, Kusara Michel, could recommendation Paco Salchi Malchi, Egon and Tomai, cause a ton relationship in Koto. The Kubune de Korea of Si. 단순히 그냥 모델 안에서 오프라인 퍼포먼스 이벨루에이션을 가지고 아, 이 레코멘데이션 시스템 알고리즘 A가 퍼포먼스가 되게 좋다, 안 좋다 약간 이렇게 뭔가 나타내는 것만으로는 실제로 비즈니스 퍼포먼스로 이어지는 거는 또 별개 문제다라는 걸좀 강조하고 싶었고 그 비즈니스 실제 디지털 메이킹으로 이어지는 데 있어서는 이 코자 인프런스에 대한 고려도 중요하다라는 부분을 라고 이해하시면 될것 같습니다. 네. 네. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, thank you for asking. So if you don't have further questions, so let me uh, continue uh, with this uh, potential outcome framework, um, which is most popular and dominant in social science areas, uh, not mentioning economics, business, psychologists, uh, political science, and so forth. So actually, the conceptually, the potential framework is very simple. Uh, 
I'm sure that you can understand the potential outcome framework in, in such a short time. So conceptually, it is very related to the, what we think in daily life. So as you know, you and I, as human beings, always compare. We, and we evaluate something by comparing it with others or with our own previous status, right? We always compare with some, some others or our own uh, to evaluate something. So the comparison itself is the way we think about some effects, right? So when we think about the effects of pets on de depression, uh, we can compare people uh, with pets to people without pets as described here, right? So uh, such comparisons is effective to reveal some uh, effect like this. However, the main question is, Comparison to what? That is the main question we need to answer. Uh, and the potential outcome framework helps us answer that question. For example, uh, we could compare the de depression levels after adopting PET, uh, sorry, uh, after adopting PET uh, to the depression levels before adopting PET. We can compare like this. Or uh, we could compare the depression levels after adopting PET uh, to the uh, hypothetical uh, depression levels if there were no adoption. So in this case, there are three alternative comparisons uh, to evaluate the relationship between uh, adopting PETs and depression. Among them, uh, which comparison is the most reasonable uh, to identify the causal effect. So that's uh, what potential outcome framework helps us. So potential outcome framework helps to answer that question. Basically, the, the potential outcomes indicate uh, what would have happened if there were no treatment or uh, if there were treatments. So such reasoning is very common in our life, right? So so that's why there are so many books uh, saying that if I knew then, right, like, so, so you can easily find several, uh, many books uh, saying uh, similar things. So those questions are talking about the uh, hypothetical potential outcomes, right? So, and this is the way the potential outcome framework defines the causal effect. The potential outcome framework defines the causal effects by focusing on what if, what if the treatment was not applied? So uh, in other words, the causal effect of treatment can be defined as the difference between actual outcome for the treated uh, when they are actually treated and potential outcome if the treat, uh, treated people were not treated. So here, the potential outcome for the treated, if they were not treated, is called the counterfactual. So the counterfactual uh, plays a central role in causal inference under the potential outcome framework. For, so for example, uh, let's think about the causal effect of reading on grade. So when we estimate the causal effect of reading on grade, actual grades, uh, when we read books, should be compared to the counterfactual or the potential grade uh, we, we would have received if we hadn't read, if we hadn't read books. So conceptually, it is easy to understand. Uh, so how to define the causal effects uh, based on the potential outcome framework, right? So, but the thing is that, so the, the, the question is, can we observe those potential outcomes or counterfactuals in reality? That is the main question. Although the, it is easy to understand the, cause, the potential outcome framework conceptually, it is not easy to implement this in reality because such counterfactuals or potential outcomes it cannot be observed by definition. So as you know, we 
cannot observe both potential outcomes at the same time, right? In reality, uh, we can observe only one on outcome, either get treated or not, right? So, so such pro problem is called the fundamental problem of causal inference. So by definition, potential outcomes are not observable. So for example, when we estimate the causal effect of reading, what we can observe in reality is not the counterfactual, a potential grade uh, that we, we would have received uh, without reading. But the reality, what we can observe is other people's grade who actually did not read books. So a such comparison group that actually did not receive a treatment is called a control group, right? So can you see the clear difference between counterfactual and control group? Mm. So now uh, we can answer uh, what, was wrong, what was wrong with the left comparisons, right? According to the potential outcome framework, uh, what we should compare to estimate the causal effect of PET is between the actual outcome when people adopt PET and their counterfactuals if they hadn't adopted PET, right? However, on the left side, what we compared in reality was actual outcomes of people who adopt PET and people who did not adopt PET, uh, which is called the control group. Okay, Professor yeah. Park. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I'm really sorry. Could you explain once more in Korean language about this slide? It's important. Counterfactual control group by summarizing by the to get slide. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So, potential outcome framework. High is on a causal effect. 그 결국에는 어떤 어떤 트리트먼트가 만약 그러니까 있어, 어, 예를 들어 아스피린으로 예를 들면은 아스피린의 어떤 코자 이펙트를 추정한다고 했을 때 아스피린을 먹었을 내가 아이스크림을 먹었으면은 아스피린을 먹었을 때 어떤 결과가 있겠죠. 근데 그거가 진짜 아스피린 때문에 내가 두통이 줄어드는지를 평가하기 위해서는 아 만약 내가 어제 아스피린을 먹지 않았다면 오늘 어땠을까? 그 잠재적인 어떤 나의 결과랑 비교해야만이 그 아스피린이 진짜 내 두통을 줄였는지를 평가할 수 있다. 라는 거를 나타내죠. 근데 당연히 by definition 만약 내가 어제 아스피린을 먹지 않았다면 어땠을까라는 이 포텐셜 아웃컷 즉 카운터 팩츄얼은 현실에서는 관찰되지 않죠. 왜냐면 나는 약을 먹었으니까. Okay. 그래서 약을 먹거나 약을 먹지 않거나 둘 중에 하나만 관찰이 되지 음. 둘 다는 현실에서 동시에 평행 우주가 아닌 이상은 이 동시에 음. 관찰하는 거는 불가능한 거죠. 이게 이제 펀더멘터 프로블럼 코자 인프런스고 그래서 음. 현실에서 우리가 데이터를 통해서 관찰할 수 있는 거는 약을 먹은 아스피린을 먹은 사람과 아스피린을 실제로 먹지 않은 다른 사람들을 음. 비교할 수밖에 없겠죠. 그게 오케이. 이제 컨트롤 그룹이라고 오케이. 하는 거죠. 그러니까 최대한 비슷한 사람이죠. 네. 예를 들면 박지원 교수님하고 저하고 나이 차이가 있으니까 그건 컨트롤 베리어블이 안될거 아니에요. 그러니까 예를 들면 50대 남자의 같은 증상을 갖고 있는 50대 남자 이렇게 돼야지 컨트롤 베리어블이 될거 아니에요. 그렇죠. 그렇죠. 네네. 사실 정확하게 그 좋은 지적 마, 말씀을 해주신 부분인데, 그러니까 이 컨트롤 그룹은 사실 어떤, 어떤 대상도 다될수 있죠. 근데 이 컨트롤 그룹을 어떻게 잡느냐에 따라서 코자 이펙트를 구할 수도 있고 못 구할 수도 있고 하는 거죠. 사실 이게 되게 굉장히 심플하고 이해하기 쉽지만 이러한 프레임워크가 가, 주는 가장 큰 장점은 코자, 현실에서의 코자 인프런스의 문제가 뭔지를 굉장히 심플리파이 해주고 명확하게 문제를 정의를 해준다라는 셈이에요. 예를 들어서 음. 교수님 말씀하신 대로 지금 여기서의 우리가 볼수 있는 거는 이 포텐셜 아웃컴 프레임워크 하에서 코셜 이펙트를 구하기 위해서 우리한테 진짜 이론적으로 필요한 거는 카운터 팩츄얼이죠. 음. 만약에 그 사람들이 약을 먹지 않았다면 어땠을까라는 그 카운터 팩츄얼인데 현실에서 우리가 가는 관찰할 수 있는 거는 컨트롤 그룹이고 음. 결국에는 이 카운터 팩츄얼과 컨트롤 그룹의 음. 이 디스크리펀시가 코잘 인프런스의 핵심 어떤 문제점이라는 거를 심플하게 보여주는 거죠. 그러니까 결국 음. 우리가 현실에서 데이터를 가지고 코잘 인프런스가 어려운 문제는 
굉장히 심플한 문제로 이렇게 환원이 될수 있는 거죠. 바로 카운터 팩츄얼과 컨트롤 그룹의 차이가 포장이 브런스의 문제고 그럼 솔루션도 굉장히 심플해지죠. 카운터 팩츄얼과 컨트롤 그룹의 차이를 최대한 줄일 수 있는 즉 카운터 팩츄얼에 최대한 가까운 유사한 컨트롤 그룹을 찾을 수 있다면 완벽하진 않지만 그래도 최선의 포장 인플루언스를 할수 있다라는 어떤 굉장히 심플한 솔루션을 줄수 있는 게 어떻게 보면 이 포텐셜 아웃컴 프레임워크의 가장 큰 장점이라고 볼수 있을 것 같아요. 그래서 말씀하신 대로 유사한, 그러니까 컴퓨러블한 컨트롤 그룹을 찾을 수 있으면 은 실제로 그 컨트롤 그룹이라고 하더라도 충분히 그 컨트롤 그룹을 활용해서 인과관계를 합리적으로 추론할 수 있게 되는 거겠죠. 알겠습니다. 아주 아주 역시 모국어로 배우니까 확 와닿네. <웃음> 아우 제 영어가 부족해서 죄송합니다. <웃음> 아니, 아니, 그, 아니 우리, 우리가, 예, 영어를 필요한 건 마켓에 예, 접근하기 위해서 필요한 거지 사실은 미친 코리안 기준은 모국어가 가장 피부로 와닿으면서 이해가 탁 되죠. 예. 그렇지만 우리가 아, 또 잔마켓을 생각하고 또 오퍼티니티를 생각하면 아, 그런 걸또 이제 우리 AI가 많이 해결해 주고 있죠. 그래도. 네. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so, so like this, uh, feel free to ask anything in Korean, so, and then uh, I, I can I also answer uh, to your question in Korean. Okay, so that's. Okay, so let me uh, start here. So, oh. Okay, here, so let's, uh, uh, let's recap uh, this slide. So as I explained in Korean, the key problems in causal inference in reality is the discrepancy between the theoretical counterfactuals and actual control group, right? So, so the, but in many cases, the control group is not comparable to counterfactuals because in observational data, Uh, we cannot control the people's behavior, right? So in the absence of the experiments, treat treatments are not assigned randomly. People select into the treatment by themselves. For example, in these examples, so let's think about the people who adopted the pet, dogs or cat, and people who did not adopt pets. People, they themselves decide whether they will adopt pet or not, right? But we as a researcher don't know why, and we don't have any control over them, right? As a result, the treatment and control group uh, could be systematic, systematically different, right? And may not be comparable even without treatment, even without adopting pet, their characteristics could be, might be different. Right? And it is not difficult to imagine that pet owners and non-owners are different in some aspects, as you can see here, uh, besides the pet ownership. Right? For example, according to some uh, surveys, the household with many members, uh, people who work full time, uh, people who are more social and uh, empathetic, and people who own their home are more likely to own pets. Right? So people uh, with such characteristics are more likely to adopt pet. So uh, if we compare the pet owners and non-owners, uh, their characteristics should be different. Uh, so in many characteristics other than the pet ownership. So such problem is called the selection bias. Um, the selection bias is the systematic difference between the treatment group in the absence of the treatment, which is called the counterfactual and the actual control group. So the, any differences between two groups, except the treatment, are also called the confounders and or the confounding factors. So I think uh, these decompositions uh, would help you understand the, uh, why the selection bias uh, uh, prevent us from estimating the causal effect. So in reality, uh, what we can estimate and what we can compare is this outcome for treated if they actually get treated, right? This is called the treatment group. And also 
And so uh, we can compare the outcome for the treatment group with the outcome for untreated. If they, they did, not actually, uh, did not get treated. So this is the control group, right? And then uh, let's add, and uh, so let's add uh, the counterfactuals here. So we can subtract and add the same value, right? Because they should be zero. So like this, so let's see this. So the, oh. So here, the outcome for treated, if not treated, this is the counterfactual, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, because uh, we subtract and add the same value, uh, it should, uh, it should not change the, the whole equations. And then uh, let's uh, rearrange these equations like this. Uh, let me remove this. Okay, then, so here, so you can see that, so let's see this. So here, outcome for treated, if treated, minus outcome for treated if not treated. So this is the causal effect uh, we want to estimate, right? However, you can see that another term remains here. So outcome for treated if not treated, uh, which is the counterfactual, minus outcome for untreated if not treated, which is a control group. So uh, this discrepancy between counterfactual and control group uh, indicates the selection bias. Okay. So we can, yeah, please go ahead. I, I think this is the principle of the uh, echromatrix. Um, can you explain in Korean again? Take example, the aspirin. Uh, actually, this is a little bit of a word that I just wrote down as a simple word, but it's actually the same thing. We group Control group, 그러니까 아스피린을 먹은 사람과 아스피린을 먹지 않은 사람을 비교를 한다고 했을 때, 그 사람들의 어떤 두통을 비교한다고 했을 때, 과연 그 비교만으로 인과관계를 추론할 수 있냐라고 했을 때, 그렇게 추론했을 때는 두 가지 이펙트가 섞여서 나올 수밖에 없다라는 거. 근데 이게 이론적으로는 이렇게 쉽게 두 가지를 디컴포즈할 수 있지만은 현실에서는 이거를 쪼갤 수가 없는 거죠. 그래서 아스피린을 먹은 사람과 아스피린을 먹지 않은 사람을 비교를 하면은 실제로 아스피린의 인과적인 효과와 그 셀렉션 바이어스 즉그두 사람 과연 아스피린을 먹은 사람들과 아스피린을 먹지 않은 사람들이 정말 비슷한 사람들일까? 아스피린을 먹었다는 사실을 제외하고도 정말 비슷한 사람들일까? 예를 들어서 뭐 조금 더 고령 그러니까 나이가 이제 점점 들수록 조금 더 이제 몸이 아파오는 게 많고 뭐 아스피린을 먹을 확률이 만약에 높다라고 했을 때 만약에 아스피린을 먹은 사람들의 평균 연령은 뭐한 아, 뭐 40대, 50대고 아스피린을 먹지 않은 사람들 보았더니 뭐 20대고 이러면 이 둘을 비교를 하면 이게 아스피린의 효과인지 아니면 뭐 나이의 효과인지 알 수가 없잖아요. 그래서 이렇게 비교를 했을 때는 아스피린의 진짜 효과와 그 두의 특성의 차이에서 오는 셀렉션 바이어스가 섞일 수밖에 없다는 라 부분이죠. 그래서 이 셀렉션 바이어스는 아까 계속 얘기했던 그 카운, 이론적인 카운터 팩츄얼과 현실에서의 컨트롤 그룹에 그 차이가 셀렉션 바이어스고 그러면 이 수식에서 정말 간, 그 인과 추론이라는 건 사실 그렇게 어렵지 이 적어도 컨셉츄얼리는 전혀 어렵지 않는데 그러면 우리가 실제 현실에서 관찰할 수 있는 이 데이터로 인과 관계를 추론하는 할, 추론하고자 하면 어떻게 해야 되느냐 간단하죠 얘만 없애면 되는 거죠 얘를 없애면 어떻게 해야 되느냐 얘가 만약에 얘가 알파고 얘가 또 알파면 은두 개를 마이너스 되면 은 이게 이제 사라지겠죠 그래서 이렇게 보면은 인과 추론 문제는 너무 심플해지는 거죠. 인과 추론은 바로 이 셀렉션 바이어스를 없애는 거고 그 셀렉션 바이어스를 없앤다는 거는 outcome for treated if not treated. 카운터팩 이론적인 카운터팩츄얼과 그러니까 즉 카운터팩츄얼이라는 거는 사실 그 트릿 아스피린을 먹은 사람들이 아스피린을 막 만약 먹지 않았었더라면 그러니까 아스피린을 먹었다는 사실 제외하고 다른 특성들 뭐 나이라든지 뭐 식성이라든지 이런 다른 특성들하고 아스피린 실제 먹지 않은 사람들 
하고의 특성이 만약 비슷하면은 아스피린 먹지 않았으면은 둘 특성이 비슷하니까 뭐 결과도 비슷하겠죠. 그러면은 이두 개가 결국에는 상쇄가 돼서 사라지고 결국 얘네들이 사라지면은 셀렉션 바이 없 없으니까 옵저베이셔널 이펙트 그 그러니까 우리가 실제로 추정한 결과와 코자 이펙트가 비슷해지는 거죠. 네, 그래서 계속 사실 비슷한 얘기를 조금 하는 셀렉션 바이어스는 우리가 컨트롤 그룹이라고 볼 수도 있는 거네요. 그러니까 셀, 어, 컨트롤 그룹과 음. 트리트먼트 그룹의 차이라고 볼수 있죠. 컨트롤 그룹과 트리트먼트 그룹의 차이. 네, 트리트먼트를 받았다는 사실을 제외하고 차이. 아까 말씀드렸던 뭐 셀렉스 뭐 아스피린을 먹은 그룹과 먹지 음. 않은 그룹. 그러니까 현실에서 만약에 봤을 때 아스피린 먹은 그룹과 먹지 않은 그룹이 뭐 나이도 차이가 날수 있고 음. 뭐. 음. 어떤 뭐 심리적인 상태, 뭐 건강 염려증 이런 거에서 차이 날수 있고 여러 가지 차이 날수 있는 이 모든 것들의 차이가 이제 다 셀렉션 바이어스죠. 그 차이를 없애는 게 바로 이 셀렉션 바이어스를 없애는 길이고 그게 이제 인과관계를 추론하는 길이다라는 거를 심플하게 보여주기 위해서 이렇게 좀 나타냈다라고 볼수 있을 것 같습니다. 단수를 잘해야겠다. 사실 거의 다. 이게 다예요. 그러니까 포텐셜 아웃컴 프레임워크는 생각보다 굉장히 간단하고 이론적으로 생각, 그러니까 이해하는 거는 정말 간단해요. 이게 포텐셜 아웃컴에 다고 실제로 포텐셜 아웃컴 하에서는 가장 중요한 그러니까 이 코자 인프런스의 가장 큰 적은 바로 이 셀렉션 바이어스고 이 셀렉션 음. 바이어스를 없애는 것이 바로 코자 인프런스고 없애기 위해서는 바로 트리트먼트 그룹에서 실제로 트리트먼트를 받지 않았을 때와 비교 가능한 그런 컨트롤 그룹을 찾는 게 바로 이 셀렉션 바이어스를 없애는 어, 길이다라는 거를 보여주죠. 그래서 뭐 인과 추론이 굉장히 어렵, 뭐 복잡한 것 같지만 이 포텐셜 어컴 프레임워크 하에서는 사실 굉장히 간단한 하나의 문제로 귀결될 수가 있는 거죠. 네, 그래서 so, 아, 여기부터는 다시 영어로 <웃음> 할게요. So the, the most important principles in causal inference under the potential outcome framework is the setters variables. So setters pairs means all other things being equal. So the treatment group should be compared to the control group only except the treatment, right? So by definition, the counterfactual is the potential outcome for the treated if they were not treated, right? So if there were no treatment, the treatment group should be comparable to the control group. So that's what the setters pairs means. So in short, the causal inference method under the potential outcome framework is are to achieve these setters pairs. In other words, is to find a comparable control group. Yeah, that's it. That's that's all for the uh, causal inference methods under the potential mm -hmm. outcome framework. The conceptually is very easy, but Yeah, so uh, the causal inference can be achieved by taking advantage of research designs in which control groups uh, can be comparable to the treatment group in all aspects, but the fact that they are treated. So conceptually, it is very easy to understand uh, what the causal inference is and how to estimate the causal effect. But in reality, the uh, the in reality, it is not. Actually, it is not easy to find the comparable control group. So that's why uh, many methodological advances have been introduced uh, to help the better causal inference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is always an error <laughs> because me? of that, we cannot exactly uh, the measure uh, we design. So, We yeah, must right. be error. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. And so the, the, the principle is very simple and very straightforward. Uh, we should find the comparable control group uh, to estimate the causal effect, uh, which is not easy in many cases in, a, in for our research. So I think uh, the 10 minutes are left. So mm. do you have any questions so far? Uh, okay. Um, question always welcome. Don't hesitate. Okay. <laughs> This is uh, uh, students mm -hmm. all the time. 
Professor, I have a question. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think I understood about the, uh, the selection bias. And I think the bias is in the, uh, the treatment group. As I understood, the selection bias is the differences between the treatment and the control group. But I think, for my view, uh, the bias is in the treatment group. Uh, for example, the case of the aspirin, uh, in same treatment group, some people uh, has uh, some people have uh, some odd ability to uh, accept the medicine, but somebody doesn't have any ability to accept any uh, medicine. So I think that kinds of the bias be among I mean the in the treatment group. So I think we should control the this bias. I mean the the same group in the treatment group. But it doesn't matter in causal inference or, uh, or the any way to control the individual factor mm -hmm. in treatment group. Yeah, that's a very uh, great question um, because actually I don't think your question is about the bias, but some heterogeneity in within the treatment groups, right? So people's. Um, so people who had aspirin uh, should, should be different in some aspect. Uh, so that's why, uh, so first of all, so uh, let me explain uh, first this. So basically, let's think about this. Individual treatment effect or ITE. So this ITE is about the causal effect for a specific individual, one person. And can we estimate this ITE under the potential outcome framework? Only one for only one person. By definition of counterfactual, the counterfactuals is not observable. Right. So, so if we have only one person, there is no way to observe the counterfactual, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is no yeah. control, uh, control groups or something. So, under the potential outcome frameworks, this ITE uh, cannot be estimated by definition. Mm -hmm. So, that's why basically the potential outcome framework is designed to estimate the ATE average. Average treatment effect, mm -hmm. ATE. Mm -hmm. So this ATE uh, is about the average effect for the treatment groups. So the mm -hmm. average, the, the average difference between the treatment group and control group. So this ATE is the basic uh, estimate of our interest. Mm -hmm. However, as as you uh, pointed out, the the treated the 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 people in the treatment group may have different characteristics. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but this ATE cannot account for such differences in the treatment group because this ATE will average everything within the treatment group and control group. So that's why recently uh, many people are concerned about the HTE, heterogeneous, heterogeneous treatment effects. Mm -hmm. So this heterogeneous treatment effect has been repeatedly increasing, uh, mm -hmm. increasingly popular these days. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, many methods uh, to estimate the heterogeneous, tre uh, heterogeneous treatment effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, doing, in estimating the HTE, the machine learning methods uh, have been widely used. For example, the causal forest, uh, some meta learners, S learners, or meta learners like this, and double machine learning. Double machine learning is also designed to estimate HTE. So uh, this HTE is one of the most uh, recent advances in causal inference. So mm -hmm. that's the very um, important way to go in causal inference. And eventually, eventually uh, we might want to estimate the individual treatment effect eventually. 
Yeah, thank you for asking that. Thank you, thank you. Question. Thank you. It's a great, great core, uh, the, the knowledge for the academic research. It doesn't matter of uh, economics. It's a matter of all scientific, scientific analytic approach. This theory and th this explanation is, uh, is a really fantastic to understand uh, the overall the research methodology. Thank you. Yeah, I have five more minutes uh, left. Okay. So do you, is there any other questions? So I have, uh, I have some more chapters, but I think uh, because of the time limits, uh, okay. I think the, the remaining chapters uh, mm -hmm. can be explained next week. And next week, I'm going to explain some more detailed methods based mm -hmm. on the potential outcome framework. And also, mm -hmm. I'd like to introduce another framework based on the causal graph, which is mm -hmm. quite different from this potential outcome mm -hmm. framework. And mm -hmm. the reason, well, actually, this potential outcome framework is much more popular in social science areas. Mm -hmm. But recently, mm -hmm. So, so the causal, graphical causal model has been so popular in AI community and you know, mm -hmm. AI and machine learning are eating mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. other disciplines. So that's why um, recent researchers have mm -hmm. begun to adopt the causal graph in causal inference. So I mm -hmm. think the graphical causal models can provide you mm -hmm. with a great opportunity for future mm -hmm. research. And, mm -hmm. and so I hope you can be some pioneers for that. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think I think so. It's a graphical design. It's a kind of a illustrate direction by arrow and rectangular and uh, triangular. The the direction with the uh, arrow and the other you know the rectangular and triangular actually is a caused by the causality, and the causality actually we get estimated uh, the 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 prediction. Uh, with error terms, but the error terms, how can we be able to prevent lower error? Is, is, this is a theory he explained right now, right? In the individual treatment, the average treatment, and the heterogeneous treatment. How can we make the reduce the heterogeneous error terms? That's the key concept of that, you know, findings, isn't it? Right, right. Yeah. Okay, students, any questions? Okay, you are, I think you are real students. Uh, <laughs> if I were you, I also I keep my mouth. Uh, it's, it's the same, but uh, always a uh, professor and teacher speak a lot and the uh, students is always listening and um, no question. But this class always open up the questions, speak English or Korean, whatever, okay? Um, it's a huge chance. I also, today I learned from him about the, the causal inference. It's a fantastic one, okay? Thank you. Professor Park, it's almost the time. And uh, can you explain a little bit about the three minutes during uh, your experience in America? And you you got the PhD from KAIST and uh, you got a job the uh, US. So yeah, right. uh, how about the language barrier and um, paper writing and the teaching? Oh, you gonna you wait talking on the Kangu Malo Kenyan. Okay. Thank you. Oh, such a site of money. It's a language barrier to Tangani, go Tangani Hangumalo at the Rang Tarego. 한데 개인 사실 당연히 여기 계신 학생분들은 저보다 영어를 훨씬 더 잘하실 거라고 생각을 하고 그러니까 저는 여기에 2019년에 미국에 나오기 전까지 해외에서 살아본 경험이 아예 한 번도 없어요. 그래서 처음 와우. 나오고 영어도 잘 못하는데 그럼에도 불구하고 한 가지 좀 느끼는 거는 어느 정도 뭐 연구와 수업에 있어서의 랭귀지 배리어는 생각보다 크지 않다. 어느 정도 시간 적응의 시간은 당연히 필요하겠죠. 그러니까 제가 이 말씀을 드리는 분은 여기 계신 분들은 뭐더 영어를 더 잘하신다 잘하실 거고 그렇기 때문에 뭐큰 외국에서 영어에 대한 두려움은 
뭐안 가지셔도 된다라는 거를 말씀을 드리는 게 아닌데 왜냐면은 처음에는 당연히 어렵죠. 근데 생각보다 리서치나 그리고 수업이나 아니 이렇게 포멀한 이런 사람 이런 자리에서 쓰는 영어는 생각보다 제한돼 있고 그래서 뭐 충분히 대부분의 분들이 노력을 하면은 극복할 수 있을 정도의 배리어다 라고 저는 느껴요. 지금 한 3년 반 정도가 됐는데 어, 하지만 그렇다고 랭귀지 배리어가 아예 없는 건 아닌데 제가 가장 느끼는 랭귀지 배리어의 가장 큰 거는 일상생활이에요. 그러니까 진짜 그냥 뭐 친구들하고 카페에서 만나서 뭐몇 시간씩 수다 수다 떠는 약간 이런 거는 사실 조금 모국어가 아니면 조금 쉽지는 않죠. 근데 뭐 저희가 뭐 일하는 데 있어서는 사실 그런 뭐 개인적인 뭐 그런 레벨까지 필요 없기 때문에 사실 여러분들이 뭐 혹시 뭐 이렇게 해외에 나오고 싶은 그런 목표가 있다고 했을 때그 영어에 대한 두려움 때문이라면 저는 충분히 안 가져도 된다라는 거를 조금 말씀을 드리고 싶고 두 번째는 오히려 제가 예상 못했는데 가장 크게 느끼는 어려움이고 좀 여러분들도 조금 더 노력을 해주시면 조금 더 도움이 될것 같다라고 느끼는 부분은 바로 생각보다 네트워킹이에요. 그러니까 왜냐하면 저도 한국에서만 계속 있었기 때문에 사실 이 네, 그리고 제 성격상 되게 막 이렇게 막 네트워킹이나 이런 소셜한 활동을 막 잘하는 편은 아니거든요. 사회 막 이런 거를. 근데 문화가 정말 다른 게 미국 그러니까 외국 같은 경우는 진짜 그런 네트워킹과 어떤 뭐 스몰 톡막 이런 네트워킹 막 서로 사람 간의 소셜 이게 굉장히 빈번하고 굉장히 많은데 제가 느끼기에 저를 포함해서 제가 가장 지금까지도 어렵운 느낌이고 제가 느끼기에 한국 분들이 정말 실력과 뭐 여러 가지 뭐 이런 거에 비해서 상대적으로 언더 이벨류에 받는 되는 가장 큰 이유 중에 하나가 바로 이 소셜한 거라고 생각을 해요. 왜냐하면 우리는 항상 되게 좀 겸손하라고 배우고 뭔가 좀 나대지 말라고 배우고 뭔가 항상 막뭐 하면 자랑하지 말라고 하는데 실제로 여기서는 더 그거를 쇼프를 해야 되거든요. 막더 사람들한테 막더 이렇게 막 나, 적극적으로 나서고 막더 약간 나를 알리려고 적극적으로 하고 그래야만 되는데 저도 사실 그것 때문에 가장 어려움을 느끼는데 그래서 여기 계신 분들도 물론 뭐 그게 뭐 개인의 어떤 성격에 따른 어떤 그런 차이가 있다는 건 당연히 100% 인정을 하지만 조금 더뭐 학회에서라든지 조금 더 적극적으로 좀 외국에 있는 교수들이나 뭐 좀더 적극적으로 뭔가 이렇게 뭐 네트워킹에 대한 이런 걸좀 연습을 조금 하고 아니면은 뭐 이런 뭐 세미나 같은 데에서도 물론 뭐 버추얼이긴 하지만 조금 더 이렇게 적극적으로 하는 태도 자체가 제가 느끼는 가장 큰 어려움이자 <웃음> 여러분들께 조금 더 어. 여러, 어, 노력을 하면 은 도움이 많이 될수 있을 거라는 부분에서 조금 말씀을 드리고 싶습니다. 사실 저도 지금도 여전히 스트로클링 하고 있는 부분이 바로 이 네트워킹이나 약간 이런 부분이기도 해요. That's right. Very good point. Um, today as time is up, I, today I'm uh, wrap up this seminar. Uh, actually, I, I invited him uh, because of his academic performance. But also he has an individual experience in the United States, but he got the PhD from KAIST. So he is well trained from his uh, academic advisor in Korea and the publication is uh, great and then got a job in the United States. So I think uh, you can do it like him. Okay, Professor Bach, thank you very much. I look forward to see you next week again. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for inviting. Yeah, 감사합니다. 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 네, 감사합니다. 이거 박 교수님 줌에서 네. 이거 손으로 쓰는 거 펜이 있는 거예요? 아, 저 지금 그 태블릿으로도 따로 아 태블릿으로 네, 태블릿을 앞에 두고 태블릿에 쓰고 있습니다. 아, 그러니까 이렇게 하고 하나는 옆에다 태블릿 두었고 두 개를 띄워놓고. 손으로 이렇게 하는 거예요? 네, 네 화면 앞에 있고 태블릿은 따로 어. 있고 해가지고 계정도 두 개로 접속을 해가지고요 따로 쓰고 아, 있어요. 아, I see, I see. 왜냐면 여기서 내가 마우스를 하니까 정확하게 빨리 못 쓰더라고 줄 긋는 건 해도. 아, 맞아요, 맞아요. 마우스로는 네. 이게 쉽지가 않아가지고 저도 이 태블릿으로 하니까 좀 편하더라고요. 어, 오케이. 그래서 그걸 하나 띄워놓고 태블릿에서 손으로 이렇게 쓰고. 오케이. 아일런. <웃음> 감사합니다. 아, 네. 하여튼 감사합니다. 다음 주에 스프링 브레이크니까 잘 쉬시고. 또뭐 쉬겠어요. 열심히 논문 리비전하고 쓰고 정신 없겠지만. 아, 네네. 그럼 다음 주에 또 뵙겠습니다. 네, 감사합니다. 네. 감사합니다. 네.